In Nashville, there's a famous street called Broadway where you will see hundreds of bands playing most nights of the week. Most of the clubs have multiple stages on multiple floors, but there's one band that stands above the rest. And it came out of kind of the ashes of the Don Kelly band. It's Kelly's Heroes. And so today we have Luke McQuarrie, who spent time both playing with Don and then is also in the, the current band that uh, you know, also includes Joe Fick and... Uh, and the drummer that we can't remember his name. <laughs> Billy Van Fleet. <laughs> Billy Van Fleet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and they both with their musicality and also just with their level of engagement and entertainment, they flat out destroy crowds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really a must see. If you come to Nashville, you have to go see Kelly's Heroes. They play you know, Wednesday through Saturday night, you know, from 6.30 to 10.30, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they just kill it. And so after the interview that we did with Don, it just felt like a very natural follow-up to, uh, to sit down with Luke. So Luke, thank you for, uh, for coming down to the lounge. Well, thanks for having me, Zach. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's start out from the beginning. So how, how did you end up uh, you know, starting to learn how to play the guitar? I know your dad's musical, your yeah, dad's guitar player. Yeah, my dad, so I, I started at 11, but it started like, it started with my grandpa and my great grandpa. I never met my great grandpa, but he was like a. I've always heard he was like a great fiddle player, like bluegrass fiddle player. Yeah. And he, him and my papa started playing together. My papa, they always say, uh, I guess he got a guitar. They picked it up at a yard sale, and they always joke and say that he was playing it by the time he got back home. You know, yeah. playing a tune. You know, anyway, he got something, something strummed out there, but. Just like a really genius guy, you know, he was like, he could build a house, he could build a gun, he could build a guitar, just like a, wow, just a, you know, for that area, just like a genius guy, you know, to be able to learn all that stuff. And he, uh, he started going across the creek and playing with my papa, Mason, my great grandpa, and he met my mama, got married, had three kids. They had my dad, who's a guitar player, and my uncle Brian, he's a great drummer, and my aunt Jen. And uh, I think my dad started when he was like 14, and he played, uh, I guess he just learned from my papa, you know, but he always talks about like opening up the album covers, I guess so like cassettes, you know, and sit, and he would like read the names, you know, yeah. and for the most part it was like Brent Mason, you know, always it was like Brent for a lot of that stuff, so he, was, yeah. he grew up being like a big fan of Brent Mason. I want to say he, uh, he went on the road he played with my papa around home for like, you know, till he was, I want to say like 25 or something, and then he decided to take it a little more serious and ended up going out on the road with Jared Neiman for five years. So he done that for for five years. I went from like five to ten, he was out on the road, you know, and I, I was just growing up, you know, and then he quit and started going to church and came home, and and when I was... 11 I think you know, they were like raised me like super strict so I didn't like I wasn't spending the night at people's houses or nothing I was going with them so after he came home I think he quit for like I want to say like one to two years he quit playing guitar and then my papa talked him into like playing the circuit around there again you know so every weekend I was loading up going too if I wasn't staying with my mama I would be Right there with them, you know. <laughs> okay, so so what would you be doing? Were you just were you just helping them out, uh, you know, carrying stuff, or, or you're hanging yeah, out? Yeah, I were you was doing? just hanging with my mom for the most part. You know, we would just sit there and and chat it up, you know. And uh, I remember they would like all you know nobody over nobody under sixty was was in there. You know, it was all old people <laughs> always. You know, but they loved to hear my dad play Orange Blossom Special and Ghost Riders. Like they would request that all the time. And I remember, like, you know, even then I remember, like, seeing him play that, and I would just get cold chills, you know, and, and like, you know, getting teary-eyed and just, you know, not even knowing why, but there was just something so magical about it at the time, you know, seeing it. And uh, I remember, like, probably, like, a few months into him playing at home like that, I was sitting back in the recliner, and he was over there. He had got, like, a little blackface Princeton, and he was testing it out. And he was playing something there, and I was like, I was just coming back there. I was like, 
I kind of learn. I kind of like to learn how to play that Ghost Riders in the Sky. And he's like, "Well, come here and I'll show it to you." So that was how it started, man. I just started started doing that. I was going through like middle school, and me and my cousin, he plays too. We wanted to be like WWE wrestlers, you know, <laughs> and we just don't have the build for that. So it was like, it was like one of those times he had kind of left me, you know, with like all I. I wanted to wrestle, but, you know, I didn't have nobody to do it with. So it was like, well, what am I going to do now, you know? So I ended up picking up guitar just kind of out of that reason, you know, and just started plunking around on it there for, you know, a few months. Or So because you didn't have the body, you know, the uh, the robust yeah. <laughs> right. build that's yeah. probably required to be a, a wrestler, you uh, yeah, did did you ever build? Did you ever have uh, like a a, a a wrestling mat or anything like that? Or did did y'all get serious about it at all? Or yeah. did, was it just kind of something that you wanted to do? We, it was just you know we yeah. we wrestled every day and watched it and we had the video games you know we had like we had a PlayStation two and had like yeah. SmackDown versus Raw all that yeah. stuff you know and man we played that we wrestle every day but. You know, as soon as he hit, like, middle school, it was like, that ain't cool no more, you yeah. know? <laughs> and yeah. I was like, you know, I'm, like, 11 years old. I'm like, well, why not? You know, why, why not? can't we just be wrestling, you know? <laughs> but he was he had already picked up yeah. guitar, and he was into that. So it was like, it just kind of made sense. Everybody around me was doing it, you know? So I was like, yeah. I guess this is what... This is what I'll go for. And this is what everyone everyone around Easy way to get doing. the girls to. Yeah. <laughs> So you start you start getting you know more serious about playing and uh, you know of course you've got your your dad that you that you're hearing it probably around the house you're going to his gigs who are some of the people that you're listening to that are that are really you know inspiring you yeah so when he got he got me as soon as I started like probably two months in I remember his first thing was like we need to take you to see the Don Kelly band and at the time wow. it was like I mean it couldn't have been it was no time, and and at that time you could still get in at like till ten o'clock. It was it was under twenty one, so you could get in there till ten. But we didn't know that, so he had took a trip, and then he came back, and I remember he was like, "Okay, they said you know you can go in, and and then we'll go." So yeah, it was just like a I want to say like a month later he took me down, and I seen J D. and Don and Joe and Artie, and I was like. Man, when I seen JD, he just you know, he was like just towered up there, you know, and he's like shaking around, and you seeing the crowd go wild, and it was just like, man, like it was just mind blowing. It was the same thing, you know, and I was, and immediately I was like, that's what I want to do, yeah. you know. I was like, that's it, you know, because coming from like up home, you know, it was just it was like I said, it was all kind of old people, but still I had that chill, but. You know, when you see it like that in like a rambunctious place like that, it was like, yeah. holy cow, this is so cool, you yeah. know. Because they're, they're putting so, you know, of course, Don and, and JD and, you know, the whole band put so much energy into yeah. the performance. Because it's not just a performance, they're also, they're entertainers. You know, because yeah, they understand right. that it's not just about their, you know, standing, <clears throat> you know, playing some blazing licks. He's also got to engage with people. Yeah, right, they, and, you know, J.D.'s, like, you know, throwing his guitar behind his head or just, like, shaking his head, and Joe's over there standing on the bass, and I just remember just getting, like, cold chills, just like, this is just crazy, man, This these, these guys, and then there's Don, you know, just pumping them, you know, and you're right. like, it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger, you know, because he's going to make it, you know, and it was yeah. it was so cool. So, yeah, I watched him, and and... We went to a guitar show around that time, and my dad had got like a Stevie Ray live at live at Montro, and yeah. like the two concerts, you know, the one where he, like the first one where they like booed him, and then the next one, and it was like, man, I wore that thing out too. And he had he had ordered a, uh, it was like a, he got it on eBay. It was like a CD of Danny Gatton, like a DVD of Danny Gatton, and like all of his little like TV spots that he had had throughout the years, you know. So for the most part, I had that, and then I had Dwight Yoakam and Austin City Limits. So I had Pete Anderson. So for the most part, it was like Stevie Ray, J.D., Pete Anderson, and Danny Gatton, you know, and I just I wore those guys out forever. And then, man, it was probably like three or four Probably three or four months after, you know, because I went home and, like, J.D. was like, 
you know, he's like 26 or 27. So in my head, I'm like 11 years old. I'm like, well, this is going to be a long time. You know? <laughs> you yeah. know, it's a long time coming. And she, my mom, had, she had the phone and she was like, you got to see this kid that Don's got playing with him. He's only 17. His name's Daniel. And it was like on YouTube, that guy Stewie had posted posted those clips of Daniel. And I, I remember like right then being like, oh, wow, so this isn't like, this isn't too far out of reach, you know, like. Right. This it, is possible. It is possible, you know, yeah. and I ain't got to be almost a 30-year-old man to be able to do it, you know. But at the time, it was like, that was the inspiration I needed, you know, was to see somebody, you know, just blazing at 17 years old. It was like, holy cow, man, where is this guy getting these guys, you know? Yeah. It was interesting to, uh, I, I learned that uh, Daniel had been, uh, he had actually gotten coached by Johnny Highland. Yeah. Yes. And so I found that, that he had he had learned a lot of the uh, the Don Kelly set and everything from from uh, from Johnny, taking lessons from him. Yeah, right. Yeah. Man, and I had, like, my dad had already had that CD, and as soon as I came home, I that Johnny was all over that, you know, and I remember, like, one of the first things I learned was, like, the You Win Again solo, you know, it was like, that was the easiest thing to learn, you know, where you, like, tune, tune the string down and then wind it back up. And I just, my dad had one of those big Microsoft computers with two speakers, you know. So I would just keep that CD in there, and I was just wearing it, like, every night. I don't know how it didn't kill him, because, I mean, I was blasting it in the bedroom, you know, in, like, a little 1,000-square-foot house. But they never said a word, but I was, like, I was over there just blasting that thing and playing along with it, whatever I could get, you know. And a lot, it was a lot of it was Johnny at the time, you know. I think it yeah. was like a mix of I had the Johnny, and then there was one with JD, and I I just like went back and forth with those, and yeah, I just listened to that thing all the time. I want to say till I was like, till I was like sixteen, I don't think I listened to anything but like Don Kelly and Stevie Ray Vaughan, like and Danny Gatton. That was it, you know. That was just all I listened to. It was all I had interest in. And I didn't. Yeah. I was raised up on like Merle Haggard and George Jones, but it didn't sound like Don played it. You know, right. it, it just didn't. It didn't have the power. And when you're a kid like that, you're just wanting that energy. You know, that's all you want. You know, I'm glad that you're 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 showing how much. You know, sometimes this gets a bad rap, but how much obsession that you had over that, because that's that's how you get good at anything. Oh it's yeah, like, is is you just have to be obsessed with something. And you have to be like, I'm listening to this day in and day out. I'm practicing all the time. Yeah, right. You know, and like I said, I wasn't, I just wasn't allowed to go, like, go out and, like, I didn't go to football games or nothing. Like, I remember in third grade, my dad, I, I like, I was like, I walked in and I had already quit soccer once. And I walked in and I was like, I, I want to learn, I want to play basketball. And he was like, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> and that, it was simple as that. He's like, no, you yeah. don't. You don't want to play basketball. And I was like, well, okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> I guess. So then, you know, I just ended up picking up guitar. But yeah, I, I was obsessed with it, you know, and I'm still obsessed with it to this day. You know, yeah. still I, I crawl on YouTube and like when I was, when I was 13 too, like, that was when the iPhone came out, you know, mm -hmm. so immediately you had, like, YouTube. So I would be on my mom's phone, like, watching these, and I remember when YouTube came on the TV, and I was like, okay. This like, is dangerous now. This is dangerous. Like, <laughs> yeah. this is all, you know, I would rush yeah. in from school and click YouTube, Don Kelly Van, and that was it. You know, that was, I stayed on that stuff forever. And there came a point when my dad, like, you know, when I first started, I was just, like, learning, like, Wanted Dead or Alive or like Ghost Riders, like just little riffs. I didn't learn chords for for months. And then there came a point when I started learning chords, you know, I want to play love songs and all that goofy stuff, you know. And then there came a point when my dad was like, you know, I can't just teach you everything. Like you're going to have to learn it yourself. And, and he, lucky for me, like he already had all that figured out. You know, he had the amazing slow downer. So he was like, you know, you take this stuff and you slow it down. You slow it down to like 35 or like 40, 45% of the speed. Pick it out note for note. Learn it note for note all the way through. And like, you know, don't miss any notes. Learn how like they're sliding or like pulling on, pulling off. And, and then just slowly work it up like 10% of the time, you know. So I would work it up like, 
I would get it all learned, play it through, you know, get play it to where I had it at like 50, and then slowly I would just keep stacking it till I could get it, you know, I'd do 60 and then 65, 70, 80, you know, and usually I could get it to like, I could get it to like 80 or 85, and then I had to sleep on it. Like I just had to, and I could wake up the next morning and within like five takes or something, I could have it, you know, I'd have it at, at like a hundred. Maybe once, you know, yeah. and then I'd be like, that had me hooked enough that I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna sit here and do it till I till I can do it perfectly, you know. Yeah, there's there's studies that that say that yeah. one of the best things you can do is practice before you go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> it says that that when you wake up in the morning, it's like your mind kind of stays on it. And then in the morning, you know, just like what you said, there's like this this aspect of I've actually kind of practiced in my head some because I did it right before I went to sleep. And in the morning, you're able to kind of take from there and actually have progressed some. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and me and my dad were just talking about this the other day, but it's like if, you, if you're if you sitting down, you know, like the other night I sat down and I was like, I'd played for like two hours. I just like, I just started using a metronome on my big speaker, so I'm like, that metronome, man, it like it keeps you locked in because as soon as you're done, you know, playing your tune. And for me right now, I'm like trying to sing better, you know. So I'm like, as soon as it's done, like that metronome's still going. So you're like, okay, well, let's just go again, you know. It's not like, okay, well I done it, you know. And then you walk yeah. away. But anyway, we were talking about that. And it's like every time you sit down, it's like it's almost like digging for gold. You know, you may get like a grain of salt, or you may get like. And then out of nowhere, you may dig and you may get like some kind of big piece of information you didn't even expect, you know, and it's like, but you have to just keep doing it. You know, if you're, yeah. if you keep doing it, you know, it's like, you'll get it, but you, you know, sometimes you might sit down and, and not get nothing, you know. Yeah, you have to be obsessed with it and you have to continue to do it and you have to keep, you know, building that hand, hand strength and, and there's so much about, there's so much that's physical and mental yeah. about about playing music about yeah playing right it well. and that was the biggest thing about like playing live you know when i started playing with don it was like you know after you play so much like there's sometimes that you you feel like you can like you can just walk in and not have to play guitar and and it'll just happen sometimes because you've been playing out live right. constantly you know so you're always like Right now, it's like I always have like 16 hours invested regardless. You know, if, if I don't even touch it at home, like I've got to go do it, you know. And then there will be times like you get like that and then you go and like it blows you back down and you're like, what was I thinking, you know, and you're like right back in the bedroom again. I'm like, okay, I got to yeah. I gotta sit here for like hours. <laughs> so let's talk about what were some really important keys to you learning to play guitar at the at the high level at which you do so you know was there just um you know kind of basically transcribing these solos where you where you're slowing them down was there was there that was there elements of like learning how chords <laughs> and scales work together what were some kind of aha moments you know as you were learning to play the guitar yeah so when I first started, it was like slowing it down, and I learned like solos note for note, you know? And I would learn like licks and stuff. And then there came a point when it was like, I was just playing licks, you know? And, and I couldn't, it was like, it just felt like everything was licks, and I wasn't focusing on like melody and chords and like, I knew all my chords, but I didn't understand the relevance and like substitutions and stuff, you know, like putting in like, a five minor over a one, you know, or like seeing how a two can work over a four, things like that, yeah. you know, those things got opened up and like when I done that, it, it made a lot of things easier, you know, but one of the biggest things was like vibrato too, you know, it was like, that was one thing that Don was always like, he harped on was like, you don't want that. He would always say like, you don't want that Billy Goat vibrato. <laughs> He's like, you don't, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be doing this. He's like, you know, you take your time. And I remember he would always like, he would do it and he'd be like, right there. That's all you yeah. need right there. Yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> wants that slow, smooth vibrato, yeah. not and the he's bah, not, bah. He's <laughs> not about like, you know, he's not about a bunch of notes. It's all about soul to him. You know, he, his thing would be like, and anything he said, it was like, you knew it, 
you knew it before he said it. You just needed somebody to say it. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you just need somebody to say, hey, that right there, that's not, you know, what you do. And he would say something like, you know, you, you just, you go, you go all the way up the neck, then you bend the note, hold that note, bend three or four, and then go right back down again, you know, and it would be something as simple as that, but sometimes you just have to hear somebody say that, you know, and, yeah. and it's like it just clicks. You know, we, we haven't, we haven't talked about how you got in the Don Kelly band, but let's, while we're here, talk about some of the important lessons that you've learned from Don, the important advice that Don, you know, as, as kind of a, a coach and a mentor to you, you know, what yeah. are some of the things that he, you know, talk about playing, um, entertaining people, tone, let, you know, just, you know, lay it on us. Yeah, man, everything for the most part. Like, yeah. I mean, everything. He's, you know, for me, I was like, as soon as I got that gig, I was like, you know, the proof's in the pudding with him. It's like, it's already there. Like, everybody's came and, and everybody's learned from him. People don't realize that, you know, it's like, 90s country music wouldn't have sounded the way it did if it wasn't for Don Kelly's mouth. You know, if he wasn't talking and saying, hey, you got to get a Telecaster, it wouldn't have happened, you know. Yeah. So I'm thinking, in my head, I'm like, and even my dad, you know, we were like, you know, anything that he says, you just listen. I don't care if you think it's wrong, if you think he ain't right, if he's being mean about it, you just listen, whatever he's saying. So as soon as I went in there, I was like, I remember being so nervous because, you know, he's such a creature I have, and I would be like, the first night I subbed, I was like, I was scared about what outlet to plug in. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, I don't want him to chew me out for me, like, for plugging in the wrong outlet, you know, because he, I just knew he's like a creature of habit, you know. Yeah. It's like he, he knows what he's wanting. He knows what he wants you to do. So I remember being like, Don, where do you want me to plug my amp in? <laughs> you know, just even, <laughs> even like the tiniest yeah. little things. And I remember telling him immediately, I was like, you know, you just tell me anything, you know, anything you think that'll help me, yeah. you tell me, you know, and he, he kept on me about like tone, you know, he would, he would keep on me about, he told me like about the Vintage 30 speaker, mm -hmm. he was like, you know, JD used one of those, like you ought to, he's like, maybe you should try one of those Vintage 30s, you know, and, and I went through some deluxes, he always wanted deluxe, like he didn't want Anything bigger than that in Roberts was just, it's just too much for that little room, you know, so. And he didn't like a lot of pedals, you know. He had yeah. already seen it done with no pedals, and he knew that you didn't have to have a lot of pedals anyway, you know, so he'd call them gadgets. He'd be like, anytime if, if, my, if, my, if I hit my pedal and it was too loud, it'd be like, immediately be like, turn your gadget down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'd be like, okay. So yeah. he always had a way of, like, really letting that be like, that ain't nothing, you know, yeah. like it's all in you, it's all in what you're doing and what you're doing, you know, he, he was, it was all about just like trying to pull a reaction out of people, you know, and not, not necessarily what you can do, but just like keeping your feel. His biggest thing was, I don't know nothing, but I got feel, you know, I, anybody can have feel if, you know, you got to practice that and it's like, it's in like little things, you know, like vibrato and just the tiniest things you don't think of, you know, how, how hard you're hitting your right hand. There, that's the thing that, like, anytime I'm struggling, I usually, like, call my dad, you know, and he's like, he's like, I remember for a long time, he was like, watch your right hand. Like, just think about your right hand. Don't even think about your left hand. Just think about that right hand a lot, you know, and just see how that helps. And for a lot of times, that would, like, that would make things just go so smooth, yeah. man, you know. So would that have to do with lightening up on your right hand? Lining up or going hard, you know, yeah. either way, just like having personality on it, you know, having right. having different textures and stuff, you know, because you don't, you want to have a little bit of everything, I feel like, in, in each, you know. But yeah, Don would, it was, it was always just like little things, you know, and a funny one, I remember I was, I was playing and he was, I was playing and I, I looked over and I think there was like a, there was a picture on the wall that I was reading, you know. And you'd never see it coming, but this happened at least like five times. Hey! <laughs> you know? hey. I, I turned around, and he cut me that look like, What are you doing? Yeah, and then after, you know, as soon as we got done, he's like, You keep me in your line of sight at all times. You you don't ever be staring over at the window, you know. And I was like, Okay, boss, like, I, it'll never happen yeah. again. What, what was a, uh, uh, 
a kind of a tough piece piece of advice that that he gave you one one that maybe maybe even like hurt your feelings some or or something like that sometimes you'd be you know for me you know it would be like the hardest thing was always like volume because it was like sometimes I couldn't even hear myself but I, but I was too loud you know and I didn't yeah. realize like I'm just a kid you know but he knows it like he's standing right there in the middle and he knows yeah. You know, and he's been working there for 25 years, so if he says you're too loud, then you're just too loud. Yeah. You're not going to argue with him, you know, but there was one, there was like one time, you know, that he got on me pretty harsh about that. I remember like going in the alley and being like, I was like, I was bawling. I was like, because he, you know, out of nowhere, he'd be like, he'd be like, I remember one night, it was like, I never changed it, man. He always told me, he was like, on Ghost Riders, he was like, I want you to stay the same volume and then Ghost Riders, crank it. Yeah. You know, well, it just happened to be like a dead night in there, you know, and as soon as it was over, I could just see the rage, <laughs> you know, building up in him because I was too loud and I was, but I didn't yeah. change nothing. You know, I had my habit. I was like, well, as long as I do the same thing yeah. and I would crank that deluxe to 10 at that time, you know, and he never said a word for heck a gear or two, yeah. you know, it was fine. And then out of nowhere, it was like, what number was that amp on? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm like dreading telling him, you know, and he's yeah. like, he's like, I was like, Don, it's on the same number. It's always on. <laughs> you know, I was really trying to like steer it away. And he's like, what number was that amp yeah. on? And I was like, 10, <laughs> you know, and he's yeah. never again, he never. said, and he just yeah. turned around and that was, and that was it. He didn't talk to me for the rest of the night, you know, and I was like, that was your lesson. Yeah, and I was like shaking at the time, you know. I was yeah. like, "Oh man!" I went. I remember I was. I called my dad. I was like, "Oh man, he's jumped all over me," you know, all of that. But yeah. that was probably the hardest one, you know. He was never. That's the only time that he was ever like super aggressive with me, and it was, and it was needed, you know. And and the next day it was like it never happened, you know. It was just yeah. that's just what a boss does, you know. That's how you got to do it if you want, if you want an outcome, I yeah. guess, you know. Okay, so let's. Let's back up and let's let's get the the you know let's get how you got you know got to start playing with Don. So you're you're going to see Don. You get inspired by JD, and then you get even you get also get inspiration by seeing Daniel Donato play because he's he's younger. You feel like it's a possibility. So what what happens next? Yeah. So I seen I seen JD, and then I seen Daniel a couple times, like till I was. 15 or 16, I still lived in Liberty. I lived in Liberty, Kentucky, born and raised there. And uh, so I think I came, I came one time and seen Brent with the players, and that was like an amazing thing too. That was, that was just as big because it was like I remember in like third, it was like Michael Rhodes' bass was just like, I mean, it was just like in your chest. You could just feel it from head to toe. You know, it was like, holy cow. So I seen those guys, and I just, when I moved, Porter was playing, so I, I moved here when I was 15, so it was like the like the middle of my sophomore year, and I was like, I wasn't happy about it. Like, I wanted to move at 18, but I was in tears when it happened, you know. At the time, I had, I had just got a friend, like I had a friend that was staying over every night, and it was like... I just got like got a pool table. It was all that stuff, you know. So when I moved, I didn't want to, but like the first day, man, it we hadn't been here. It was like January, like January third or something of like 2016. So it was freezing, and the yeah. first thing I, I just wanted to go see Don, you know, like, and Porter was playing, and I wanted to go see Don, so. My mom and dad went in, and it was 21. They had changed it to, like, right. 6 o'clock, 21 and up. So I couldn't get in. So I I bundled up in, like, three layers of clothes, and I was like, I told mom and dad, I'm like, I'll be fine. Like, yeah. he's bound to see me if I stand here. Like, he's bound to let me in. Like, they're not going to let a 15-year-old a kid stand out here and freeze, you know, just to watch music. <laughs> so I remember mom and dad walked in there like, well, if you need anything, just call us, you know. Yeah. Like, if you need anything, just call. We're going to be right <laughs> we'll in here. Get you a know? shot of whiskey or something. Walk, yeah, they walked <laughs> on in. So I was sitting out there, and I probably stood out there like an hour, and then the drummer, I seen him see me, and he, like, waved at me, yeah. and then I seen him start talking to Don. And I was, I knew in my head then I was like, hmm, like something's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be, you know. So after, like, five minutes there, he, Don, like, motioned me in, you know. 
So I walked in, and like the door guy let me in. He's like, you a guitar player or something? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm Scott McQuarrie's kid. And he's like, oh, really? He's like, well, you can stand over there at the door, but don't go past the ATM, you know? Yeah. Just, but you can stand there. That way you're not freezing to death. Yeah. And after that, I just went every day. Like, because I only live like three miles, you know? So I'd have my, my mom, oh, bless her heart, she would drop me off every day, her dad. They would drop me off like... Man, there was times that I went like Wednesday through Saturday for a little while. You know, I would go every day, and I, and when I came, you know, before I like moved here, I didn't realize how much of it was Don. You know, like till I was sitting there and like watching him coach it. You know, I was so into like the guitar and like the entertainment of it. I didn't realize that man, it's all coming from this guy. Mm -hmm. Like it, everything that's that's being done is because he's like hey, you need to do this, you know, or you need to do that. And watching him and, like, watching his rhythm, like, you you seriously realize, like, he's leading this thing. Like, it's his acoustic guitar, you know. And that's a crazy thing is to see someone, like, playing the backbeat, and they're leading everything, you know. It's like, without him, it was like, it just wasn't the same, you know. But, so, yeah, I came and... I just watched them, you know, for a year, I think. Then my dad happened to run into Don at, at the Guitar Center or something, you know, and just, he had always told him, you know, if you ever need a sub, or you know, never trying to, like, take anybody's gig or nothing like that, just if you got the chance to play with Don Kelly, it was like, that was just a dream, you know. So, yeah, he ran into him, and he was like, you know, it would just... That just, you know, my kid would just love, you know, that's just a dream. So he said, well, you know, if it means that much to that boy, then you tell him to come down Sunday night at 1.30 in the morning and we'll we'll get him up to play a couple tunes. So that was like, that was probably like, actually like five or six months into living there, you know. So as soon as that, as soon as that happened, I was like head over heels, you know. So that was the first time I sat in with him and, yeah, so I sat in and it, and he ended up getting my dad up too. He ended up getting it was me and my dad that night, and Porter was gracious enough to just let us do that, you know, and sit in on his rig. I love Porter to death, you know, but he uh, he let us sit in, and man, that was for me that was a dream. Like I never ever thought I'd get to play with those guys because those it was like, and it was I remember, your dream. Yeah, yeah, it was my dream, you know, and I remember as soon as that happened, and as soon as they kicked off, I just remember thinking. I've never heard anything this powerful yeah. in all my life. And it immediately leaves you like, well, what do I do? Like, where's my place up here? Like, because, I mean, it was so full. With the, without the guitar, it was like with Don and Joe. And, and I think it was I think it was Matt Bowley at the time. But with those guys, it was like, and he was, he was subbing. It was a sub drummer. But Don's rhythm, it could just feel anything. You know, it was just crazy how much it could feel. So you got to sit in with him, and so how did things progress from there? How did the experience go of sitting in with him? Oh man, it was like rough. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, I was like, you know, you you just can't you can't crawl up with a band like that and just like nail anything. It's just not possible, you know, especially being fifteen years old, you know. So it was, you know, there was parts of it that was rough, but there was good parts out of it, you know, and I. I edited out a video of, of like solos, you know, of the good ones, you know, and there was a, plenty of bad that night too, you know, but I didn't play with him after that for, for months, 
so I didn't, I just went back and kept watching, you know, and that, and that was it. You know, I was happy with that. That was all I ever wanted was just to, just to get to play 30 minutes, you know. So, yeah. you know, I went back and watched him, and then that was in, like, May of that year, I think. And then later on around the winter time, I was sitting down there one night, and he, he just happened, don't know what came over him or what it was, but he, he came down, and he's like, hey, you know, any Sunday night, that last set at one thirty, any Sunday night you want to, you just come down and set in with us. And you can bring your guitar, you can play mine, you can play through my amp, you know, yeah. whatever, but just, if you want to, you know, go for it. And I remember being like, you mean next Sunday or? And he's like, yeah. any Sunday. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, well, okay, this is it, you know, like, okay, I'll be here every Sunday, you know. You so, just got your foot in the door. Yeah, I just got my foot in the door, so... My mama would wake up. She she got up at four in the morning for work, but she would get up at twelve thirty, oh and goodness. at midnight, you know, get ready, drive me down there, drop me off at one fifteen, drive around the block for an hour, and pretty much an hour, you know, take me back home, go to bed, and get up at four thirty and go to work. <laughs> what does your mom, What does your mom do? Just. Anything, you yeah, know. Yeah. At the time, I think she was working at Vanderbilt, like checking people in, you know. But yeah. I just got the best parents in the world. Yeah, you know? they're that's just golden. Such a huge investment on your parents' part into into your your career. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that they were just, you know, just the best of like. I just can't brag enough about my mom and dad. They're just the best, you know. Yeah. So, but anyway, so yeah, I done. I went and sat in with him, and probably like. Five or six times after sitting in on Sundays, I remember Don, like, he got off stage, and my dad took me one night, so he walked over there, and I see him talking to my dad, and I know where he comes back, and he's like, I told your dad there's going to be a, a Sunday or two coming up that Porter can't make it, you know, if you want to, if he'll bring you down here, and if he'll let you, you know, you can come and sub one night, so I was like, yeah, Ooh. you know, that was like, Okay, yeah. that, now this is like the total dream. Like <laughs> you're the man. Yeah, now if I just sub one night, like I'm happy, you know, I'll be fine. So I, I mean, I was like on cloud nine, you know. So I said I done that. I subbed with him, and then he never called me back for I want to say like eight months or something. Like he never called me back. He even got another guy on Sunday because Porter didn't want to do Porter didn't want to do it. So he got David Graham on Sundays. And I remember at the time, that just broke my heart. You know, yeah. I was like, I was in tears because I was like, I thought, you know, that I was going to be the next in line. But, And he was using another guy to sub, you know. So even when those guys couldn't make it, I was not like nowhere in the picture, you know. So I was like, and then you hear like all these old guys talking like, Don's going to retire, you know, he's not going to be here much longer. You know, there's like all kinds of negativity was just going on and then, out of nowhere, man, I just got a phone call and it was it was like midsummer and it was like, hey, can you can you? It was Joe and he was like, hey, can you come fill in a couple Fridays and Saturdays for us? And I was like, yeah, for sure, you know. So immediately I I went and done that and just like after that, it wasn't clear of what was going on, you know. But I guess Porter had already like seen his way out and. And it was like me and David Graham, like David Graham was doing some nights, like Wednesdays and Thursdays, and I would do Fridays and Saturdays. And Don just like, he slowly gave me the gig throughout that time. I got in a little trouble and I was working like, I was a grunt man with my dad at construction. So like right at the time, I was like a month into this, like, like lifting, you know, these big pieces of plywood. They're like bigger than me, you know, I'm <laughs> lifting them up and... Right at that time was the same time Don called. Like, it couldn't have worked out better in my favor at the time, you know, because I was like, I did not want that job, <laughs> you know. But So as he, he slowly gave me that, and, yeah, that's that's kind of how it went, man. I just started started those Fridays and Saturdays, and he would let me know. He's like, you know, here before too long, I'll give you Thursdays. And then you know, it was a couple, like a month old by, and he's like, I'll give you Wednesdays, you know. And he slowly just gave it to me, and then he ended up giving me Sundays before he quit those for a while. And, and David Graham was always out on the road. Like, he's got his own trio, so he just, you know, he, al he was already doing something else. So yeah. it wasn't nothing against him. It was just like I was there and ready to go, you know. Yeah. So, so then, you know, then 
you're there. You're you're the you're the guitar player in the Don Kelly band. Yeah. And how did you did you were you able to to kind of separate yourself from yourself and and look and look at the situation? Could you see how much you were progressing as a guitar player playing that much every night? Could you see how were, were you able to say it's get, it's getting easier or or any anything of that sort? For a long time, it just felt like I was drowning, <laughs> you know, yeah. for for probably, you know, at least a year, over, probably a little over a year, it just felt like every night I was just getting my butt kicked, you know, it was just like constant, just because, you know, you just don't, you you know, you just got to have experience, you know, and it just takes so many times of doing it and somebody, and having somebody there like that, you know, that's just golden to have somebody like Don, you know, yeah. just telling you, this is what you do, you know, and I would, it immediately made me like, I was playing guitar more at home, you know, because it immediately made me like, wow, you know, you this ain't no good, you know, and every night it was like kicking my butt, so yeah. every night I was going home playing and waking up and playing and well, just constantly yeah. playing, you know, and then after, you know, Don's biggest thing too was like, get you get you what you want to do and stick to it you know and that's a hard thing to do at like 16 because you're just learning everybody else's stuff you know you got to learn everybody else's stuff so you know at the time I was just with Don for the most part of that I was just playing like a lot of you know stuff I had learned and just trying to trying to like manipulate around it and learn at the time you know but for the most part it was like I just don't want to make a mistake, <laughs> you know, like I don't want to miss a note if I can throughout yeah. the night, you know, because for a long time I was just struggling. <laughs> so it sounds like that, you know, especially during that first year, you know, you said you were getting, kind of getting your butt whooped and such, that you were just, all those spots where you were, were struggling, that you were really working on those things at home and then, you know, partially so you didn't embarrass yourself or get into trouble, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, and you know, <clears throat> Like Don, that was just, you know, he, he always would tell you, you know, what to do. And his biggest thing was, like, learn something every day. Like, that was something that Red said was, I learn something every day, you know, no matter what it is. I don't care if it's one thing. Like, learn something, you know. That way you're exercising it. So I just kept trying to learn. And I, I really got into, like, Jack Pearson. You know, I really, I love him. Like, he's one of my favorites. But. I got into those guys and just started listening to that and just trying to trying to get to where I could just keep up with those guys, you know, because at that time, like, playing fast, like, it'll get there. If you keep doing it, like, it's going to get there, you know. If you're slowing it down and then you're going and exercising it out, you're going to get to where you can play fast. Mm -hmm. But then there's going to be a point when it's like, okay, well, I got that, like, I just want to play with some soul, you know, like I really want to be soulful and like I want to be able to like pick my notes and like know what I'm about to do and why I'm doing it, you know, not just like playing a lick or something. So that was the biggest thing, you know, but with when I was playing with Don, it was like hammering down and like just just keeping a tight script, you know, because he didn't change nothing right down to the looks he gives you on stage, you know, and if you didn't. He might, you know, it might be at the end of the song and he looks over and he's like, and if you wasn't looking, he'll never say a word, but you'll feel it. Like, you'll just know that you didn't do your normal habit there. You know, like you didn't, you didn't obey the normal habit. And it might just be like, he might just turn his back for 30 seconds, you know, and, and you're like, in the back of your mind, you know, huh, I didn't look at him like I usually do, you yeah. know, or just little things like that, that he had it so so scripted and so perfect of like exactly what he wanted for a show that it was it had to run you know it, it just had to run right because and that was the hardest thing was just figuring out like well, what do i want to do you know and being a guitar player you're like you always want to improvise like you always want to know you can just crawl up and like and just blister something and it just happened you know but it just don't work that way some nights you know some nights it's there and some nights it's not and you got to have that script ready for when it's not there. So were there times where you were you kind of had solos worked out ahead of time and sometimes where you would kind of just straight improvise or how did how did that work? Yeah, yeah, I had there was like some songs that I, you know, I'd worked up and and I had my solos worked up, you know, and then yeah, there was some stuff that I'd 
that I would just always be like, okay, I'm just going to like the blues song. You know, we'd do like one blues song a night, and it would always, or maybe two or three, and that was always for me, it was like, okay, like, here, I'm just going to, I'm just going to play, you know, because it's all about feel anyway, you know. So I would try not to just, like, rehearse a, a solo for that, you know. But there's some stuff, you know, like truck driving man and things like that. There's just some nights, man, you're not going to be able to crawl up and do that, you know. You you might not even be able to get through your solo that you've worked up, you know. So you just got to have that stuff ready. So, yeah, there was stuff that I that I had worked up and then stuff that I didn't for sure. Yeah. How did you kind of get get the news that Don was kind of moving away from playing? Well, that was just man, it was out of nowhere. You know, we had just got we had just got Billy in the band, so he had been with us like six months, I think. And I remember when that when COVID hit, it was like like the first thing we seen was the hand sanitizer on the wall, you know. And it was like, and Don's first thing was like, hey. Right after you're shaking hands, you go down and you hit that hand sanitizer, like right now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you know he was already like he was he was you know he he was very careful about being sick because he's seventy five, yeah. you know, and he also, was seventy three at the time. Yeah, and so. also wanted you to be able to play. Didn't want to be sick. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, so as soon as man, it was like Saturday night we played, and then I played a gig. I played a trio with Joe like we do now across the street. And the word was getting out that everybody was closing down. And it was yeah. like, everybody was like nightmare. You know, it was like, well, what are we going to do? Like, yeah. you know, what, what are we going to do, you know? So after that, you know, Don, Don would always go on like, oh, I'm not going to be doing this much longer. I'm not going to be doing this much longer. But the truth is he'd do it till, till he wouldn't, till he couldn't. You know, he would do it till he couldn't. And he'd tell you that now, you know. But after like... After a month or two of being shut down, you know, he was pretty set on, like, you know, I just don't know if I can do this, you know. And, and he's like, I, I just don't want to get sick, you know. So it strung out a year, you know. And as soon as we all went back, we all got COVID, you know. We all did get it, like, two or three months in. It was, like, immediately, you know. So you can't blame him for not doing it, you know, not coming back because he would have got sick. We all did, you know. But as soon as that happened, it was just like, Man, we begged him, like me and Joe, we were on the phone always like begging him, like, man, you got to come back to work, you know, like, you can't, you know, we don't want to do it without you, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't never like that, you know, but he already had that house, you know, and his boy, you know, and I'm sure he's like, he needs to spend time with his son, you know, and, and go down to Florida and do that, you know, so he already had that in his head, he already had a free house down there, and it was like, it just seemed right, you know, and he yeah. wasn't, for the most part, he was, he, you know, we went back because we we're like, well, we ain't scared to get sick, you know, it, we'll be okay. But for him, it was like, well, you know, I could die if I get sick, yeah. you know, so he never came back. And we started with David Graham played with us like a four piece and kind of took Don's spot there for a while. And then, like I said, he's got his road gig, you know, and his little the Eskimo brothers. So. He went back to doing that, and we just slowly like morphed into the trio, you know, and that's just kind of where we've been going ever since. Yeah. But yeah, he just—it was sad, man. Like him leaving, you know. It's still sad, you know. I call him every day, and I'm like, I sure do miss you, you know. I didn't got nobody to run around and eat with. <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah. So, but but y'all have you know of course been a a, a great success and and. You know, I think one of your, you know, kind of feathers in your hat was, you know, getting to open a, a show for Jordan Peterson. Yeah. So, so he he just came came in and saw y'all play one night. Yeah, man. He, uh, I didn't know him. And the door guy, Kevin, at the time, my buddy Kevin, he was like, he walked in and we took a break and Kevin was like, he's like. He's like, do you know that guy over there in the suit? And I was like, no. Of course, he was so out of place. Like, Jordan yeah, yeah. Peterson's in there, you know, and he's <laughs> like, three decked suit. out in his three-piece suit, you know. And he's like, that's Jordan Peterson. He's like, he's one of the most famous people there is, you know. And he's yeah. like, and and I and I didn't even know. I had, I had heard him and didn't even realize it, you know. So he came up and talked to me and just a sweet. And just like, he's just like a super kind person, you know, super humble and. That was so cool, you know, and 
he just came up and like complimented us, you know, and Joe knew who he was. Joe had had his book and I didn't, I didn't know him, you know, but I was like, it's so nice to meet you, blah, 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 you know, and, and that was it for, for that, you know, he had said something, I guess, to Joe about like, I want you guys to come and open my show, but, or close it out, but I didn't, I didn't know anything about it or anything till it was probably a little while later, and then, to be honest with you, that's not been too long ago, but I can't remember how we, how we got that, but he had, got us to close out at the Ryman, you know, and that was like, for me, it was like, I want to play with Don Kelly, I want to play the Ryman Auditorium, like, and I want a Fender deal. That was my three things. Like, <laughs> I want these three things, and like, if I can do that, like, I'll be happy, you know, and that was, <laughs> and, <laughs> was the last one. I was like, holy cow, man, <laughs> you know, so I did not, I always expected, like, maybe in, like, 10 or 15 years, I'd have to get, like, a gig with an artist, you know, and, like, play back up to get to play the rhyme, and I never expected yeah. I'd get to go over there and play Ghost Riders on the rhyme and auditorium, yeah, you know. with, you know, With Kelly's Heroes, yeah, yeah. you know. It was, like, <laughs> it was just mind-blowing, you know. that I'm so thankful for that, you know. That was just, like, he just made such a dream come true for me, you know, and I can't thank him enough Yeah. for that. Is he a musician? Jordan? Yeah. I think he writes songs. Okay. I don't think he. I don't think he plays, but he's. Yeah. He sent me some songs he's wrote. He can write some songs for sure. Yeah. What was it, what was it about y'all that just really you know that floored him so much? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Honestly, no, I, mean, I don't it's, know. You know, well, I think he loved a, He loved Ghost Riders. I know that he yeah. loved that. You know, he loved the fact that that we play that head and then we go out and we just kind of go out on a limb, you know, right. and just see what happens. The freedom and everything that y'all have in there. Yeah, he yeah. loved that and he loved getting to see like the room build, you know, with excitement and stuff like that. I think yeah. that that was what he really liked about yeah. it, you know. And seeing Joe and Billy, it's like, how could you not like those two, you know? They're just, they're just crazy. <laughs> Gear. I mean, I guess that seems like what we ought to do since you have a guitar with you now and, and you got like an amp and a pedal board and stuff. So let's let's start off first with, you said one of your wishes was to have a Fender deal. Yeah. So do you have a Fender deal? I do, yeah, yeah. This is my custom shop. It's a Fender custom shop, thin line Telecaster. That's beautiful. Yes, sir. So so you spec this out? You told them what you wanted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, and I got this... The only thing that's kind of different about it is I, I wanted like the regular, you know, the regular knobs and stuff. I didn't want like the, you the know, big, it has the big pick guard right. and like the, it doesn't the, have the knobs plate. are offset. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted I wanted this like that and then I, I asked for this little half guard. So I got this and, and then this is Brent's humbucker in the front. So I got that. And then this is a Lindy Fralin Blues Special in the back. So I had to replace that, but I love that thing, man. So I used those in like everything and... Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's like yeah. a, the biggest neck that they had, and why'd it. you go with a maple cap neck? <clears throat> Man, that was actually that was the advice of like my dad and the Fender guy. Both were like, "Yeah, like th those are super cool, you know." So yeah, I are. never had one, and I was like, "Why not? You know, yeah. why not grab one?" So I love it. It's 
beautiful, beautiful guitar. Let us, uh, you. Pl you know, play a little bit on the, the neck humbucker so we can hear that, if you don't mind. positions it sounds really good like you know the humbucker like a What kind of thumb pick do you use? It's a Fred Kelly. I just started using it like probably like a month ago, but they're like the light Fred Kelly thumb picks. I was using like the blue Dunlops, but they're just they were a little too long, so I yeah. started using this so I could like flat pick, you know, a little bit. Because that that's one of the hard things about it is for thumb pickers, if they want to try to strum, they need to have one that's kind of that's, that's shorter. Yeah, and, right. Yeah, yeah, that was that was why I got this. And I started when I started playing, I'd used these, and then I I swapped because I was losing them, and they were like higher, you know. So yeah, my dad was like, "We can't afford all these thumb picks if you're gonna be losing them all the time." Because <laughs> those are you know a picks like you know you know twenty cents or something like that. Thumb picks can be like a dollar or more. Sometimes, yeah, right. you know. Now they're only like a dollar, but back then they were like three fifty or something. Oh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. What uh, what strings do you use? I've been using I've been using elixirs like ten through forty six. Yeah. So I either use those or sometimes I use like the new Diodario. There's like a new white pack. Yeah, I think that's the XS. Yeah, yeah. So I've been trying those too, and those are cool. But I kind of just swap between those for the most part. Yeah. So let's see. So we got the guitar. You got we got strings. Pick. Uh, tell us about your pedal board. Oh, yeah, so I got this RC booster that my friend Johnny Hawthorne gave me over at Exotic. So I love that thing, man. I keep it on, like, every solo I'll have it on for the most part, you know. Sometimes I'll, like, keep it off for, like, rhythm, and then I put it on. And sometimes I just keep it on the whole time. So I love that thing. And then right now I got this TS-9 on here. I go back and forth between that and, like, the TS-808. It was, like, Stevie Ray, you know, is my friend my yeah. favorite so I love those things that that one's really cool and and it just gives you like a little bit more grit you know and then this DD3 I, I've swapped through delays I had an old DM2 but it's broke right now I love those but so I just got that one on there right now but it's a great pedal too you know and so and then you of course got a you know boss tuner on the end yeah and then a boss tuner yeah. and then uh and then that's a homemade pedal board that your dad did yes yeah, sir yeah, yeah my dad done that and i yeah. love the fact that you've got uh you've got some little uh, dc jacks there and then you've got two one spots plugged in so so, so an open plug for true tone thank you yeah right yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> so yeah i use i love those one spots man and my dad done that because he had one of the echoplex pedals you know and it was like it was like no matter what he done it was buzzing you yeah. know, so he ended up doing doing that, like running two different ones, and that fixed it. So right, yeah, that's why he done that. Yeah, 
And, uh, you know, of course, you've got the classic uh, Blackface Deluxe Reverb. Tell us a bit about the amp. Yeah, so my dad got that when I was, I want to say I was like 13 or 14. He had, I was telling him about this earlier, but he went up to uh, Mike's Music in Cincinnati. And at the time, like, you couldn't find Deluxe Reverbs, you know. There was none, and they had like six of them. So he went up there and swapped a, swapped a Blackface Vibrolux for it. It was all original, and this thing's, it's had like the transformer changed and a couple other things done to it, but it's just a great amp, man. He found it, and when I started playing with Don, he was like, maybe you should try that blackface out, and I've just been playing it ever since. Yeah. So that's the amp that you play with Don. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, with Kelly's Heroes, yeah. that you use with Don. Uh, yeah, I use it all the time, and it's got an old Celestian Vintage 30 in it. I love yeah. Celestian. They're great, and um, yeah. Love the vintage 30s. Those are awesome. Yeah, they got a little more mid-range to them. Yeah, yeah, man. They they just break up just perfect. Yeah. Tell it, you know, since since you got the guitar out, uh, tell us a bit about like, when you're playing over changes. Do you uh, are you thinking about chord shapes or, <laughs> or you know what, what what are you what are you thinking of? Like let's say you know just like walking the dog or any kind of one four five song. You know what are what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about melody lines? Are you thinking about scales, chord tones? What do you think? I think it's a little of all. You know, I think about I think about like the chord, and you know, you always got like your licks and stuff that you turn to. You know, you always got like your bag that you that you go to. So I'll be thinking about, you know, sometimes if I'm struggling and I'm not like if I'm not hearing nothing, or I don't have an idea. Like I'll just turn to an old faithful, you know, like an old lick or something. But if I'm like, if I'm in that mode, you know, and if I've like, if I'm, I can, there's times that I can like see, you know, and it's like I can just, there's times that I can just pick out things, you know, and it really just depends on how much you've been playing that day for the most part, you know, but yeah, for the most part, it's just like, it's a combination of things and like just focusing on the chord as long as like, as long as you know what's coming, you know, and you know how to play around like that chord, you'll you'll get it, you know, for the most part, as long as you're not hitting anything outside of those notes, you know. Yeah. So let's say there's an 11-year-old kid out there who's looking up to you, and he wants to learn to play like you. What do you recommend to him to do? The amazing slow downer. That's probably what I would recommend is slow downer and a lots of Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> if you like it, you know, if you love the blues and... Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, you know, just whatever whatever you want to learn, learn it, you know, and don't don't waste no time. If you got something you got to do, just get up and do it, you know, and that's all you can do, you know. If you're doing right and just you just do what you're supposed to do, you know. If there's something that you like and you hear, then learn it. Don't stop till you got it down, you know, and and learn your chords up and down the neck, you know, learn how learn your major scale learn melody you know that's a big thing is like learning melody you have to learn that you know and <clears throat> learning all your different chords down the neck learning how to play out them learning how to play your scales through that and your pentatonic scale you know just all that stuff so you're 22 and you've already done mo most of the things that you've you've dreamed of so far which getting a fender deal playing at the rhyme and playing with don kelly what are what are your next dreams and goals? Man, I don't know. Probably probably to write some good heartfelt songs, yeah. <laughs> for sure. You know, and, and try to work on singing. You know, for me right now, it's like just trying to get better at singing and writing. You know, yeah. that's that's my biggest goals. And honestly, just to keep playing with Joe Fick and Billy Van Vliet, like those guys are just golden. You know, and yeah. I'll die a happy man if I'm still sitting with him at Robert's Western World at 60 years old. That, I'll be a happy man. <laughs> that, that's so fantastic you know? that you that 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 you love it and you're getting to play with those guys and and that again I just have to give a plug for anyone that comes to Nashville. The must do is they got to go see you play, and it's and it's Wednesday through Saturday and you all play what again 6:30 to 10:30 mm -hmm. something like 630 yeah 6:30 to 10 yep yeah. Yeah, they got got to go see you play. Yeah. Well, Luke, thank you so much for coming down. Uh, such, such an honor. You're you're such a great player and uh, such a great story. Thank you so much for uh, for coming down and doing this. Well, thank you for having me, man. I watch them all the time, so I really appreciate it. Awesome. Hey, y'all. There's a couple people I forgot to mention in this little interview. 
First off, Guthrie Trap. You got to go see him at the Underdog on Monday nights. Uh, James Mitchell, he's a big session guy here in town. Got a great album out himself. Ford Thurston, Ben Haggard, Steve Warner, Tommy Emanuel. There's just so many to mention, but those guys should definitely be mentioned. I've learned a lot from them. Also, I'd like to thank Terry Warner, um, Tooley Dalton, Brian King, and Mark Hardwick for giving me some of my first gigs. Mark Meese for letting me trample all over his when I was just a kid. And all those musicians I played with up home, they, I've learned something from them all. I'd like to thank all my endorsements, Steve and Ben over at Fender, Johnny at Exotic, and Rick at Celestion, and, and Jayco Straps. I'm sure there's a few I'm missing, but I'd like to thank them all and just appreciate all the help along the way. And I'd like to thank you, Zach Childs, and Bob over at True Tone Lounge for having me. Thank you, guys.